and I will introduce our guest speakers. So I'm just going to share my screen quickly. All right. Okay, so thank you and welcome to the Wetland Institute Speaker Series. Our final webinar is on cultural value of wetlands and archaeological assessments. Uh, before we go any further, I would just like to thank our sponsors. Without their generous support, we would not be able to offer this webinar at no charge to our participants. So Environment and Climate Change Canada, the Province of British Columbia, Habitat Conservation Trust Foundation, and Wildlife Habitat Canada. I'd also just like to respectfully acknowledge that we are hosting this webinar on various traditional territories of the, the following nations. So the BCWF uh, office is located in Surrey, which is the traditional territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Keitsi, Kukwetlam, Kwantlen, Kikite, Swasim, Stolo, and Musqueam First Nations. Uh, Evelyn George is a member of the Lake Babine Nation, and she is joining us from Prince George, which is the Clately Tene. Um, part of the da Dakil Carrier First Nation. My apologies if I pronounced that improperly. And Genevieve Hill is joining us from the Royal BC Museum in Victoria. And that is the traditional territory, traditional territory of the Lekwungen speaking peoples um, of the Songhees and the Esquimalt nations. Uh, so just a quick overview of what the Wetlands Institute usually is. Uh, it's usually an intensive seven day hands on workshop that educates participants about wetland stewardship, restoration and construction. This involves in the field learning to practice up to date field techniques and usually our participants gain experience restoring or enhancing at least one wetland. There are limited seats. Uh, to join. So participants need to apply with a project to attend the Wetland Institute, and it is free to BC residents. Uh, we value this workshop, the seven day workshop at over a thousand dollars. And um, to apply your project must be wetland related, either restoration, protection, enhancement, or education. And then all of our participants receive up to three years post workshop. So um, this year was a little different due to COVID-19. We did, had to host things virtually, but next year we are hoping to do a hybridized version of the Institute where all of our classroom learning sessions will be hosted virtually and then we'll meet safely outside using COVID-19 safety protocols. So if this is something that you're interested in participating in, please make sure to get on our mailing list, shoot either myself or Molly an email if you're not already on our mailing list, uh, and then we can give you further details about the 2021 Wetlands Institute. So uh, I just want to make sure we set you up for success. So a couple housekeeping rules. Um, there's two icons down at the bottom of your screen. Please only use the chat icon for technical questions regarding Zoom. And then for questions for the guest speakers, please use the Q&A button. And we're going to be saving your questions for the end of each guest speaker's presentation. Uh, and Molly will be our Q&A moderator, so she'll read out your questions to the guest speakers on your behalf. Uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce our guest speakers. So um, our first speaker this morning is Evelyn George, who is a former counselor with the Lake, Lib Lake Babine Nation, and she is a researcher of Indigenous people and a wetland enthusiast. So Evelyn was born in Old Fort, BC on Babine Lake, and she went to Lejac Residential School during her early education and moved to many schools then, um, until finally ending up in Prince George. Evelyn had been in the workforce until she went back to school at CNC in 1994 and graduated from accounting and finance in 96. She then went on to university at Northern British Columbia uh, the University of Northern British Columbia, apologies, and continued her studies and graduate with a Bachelor of Arts in 2002 and has been working in research with Indigenous people within her area and is now working with Lake, Lake Babine. Uh, Genevieve Hill, who is our second guest speaker, she is the collection manager and researcher of the BC Archaeological archaeology collection in the Indigenous Collections and Repatriation Department of the Royal BC Museum. And she began studying archaeology in 2000, obtaining a BA from UBIC and an, a master's and PhD from the University of Exeter, where she focused on wetland ecology archaeology. She also worked as a consulting archaeologist and as a project officer at the BC Archaeology Branch before taking her current position at the Royal BC Museum. 
Her research focuses on Indigenous use of wetlands and the roles of perception and policy in the identification and preservation of cultural sites. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen really quickly. Um, we do have a small gift for Evelyn. Uh, we were very excited that she uh, was able to join us today. Um, and our, the manager of the wetlands program, Neil Fletcher, heard Evelyn speak uh, quite a few years ago, and he was really moved by her. So we are very, very grateful that she was able to join us today. So I'm going to pass this off to Molly. Um, we just have a small gift for you, and I just wanted to show that to you before we got started. Um, we wanted to uh, give you a gift um, to show and express our uh, gratitude um, that you're coming to speak with us. Um, so wish we could be able to give this to you in person, but we have a, a red cedar bentwood box um, with a dragonfly inlaid on top um, of abalone shell. Um, as someone who is very passionate about wetlands, we thought this was an appropriate gift to, from a um, Indigenous art organization uh, to share with you because uh, dragonflies are not only um, very iconic wetland species, but they're also considered environmental sentinels. Um, they can only be found in clean and slow moving water. You'll never find a dragonfly in a contaminated or polluted site. Um, so when you see dragonflies, uh, you are able to think of wetlands. Um, as well as the um, kind of compassionate and generous spirit that is associated with them as well. Thanks so much, Molly. So Evelyn, uh, we'll be sending that to you in the mail. Um, without further ado, Evelyn, I would like to pass this off to you so you can share your experiences and your knowledge with us today. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the gift um, and the great introduction. Um, my name is Evelyn George. And I'm from the Lake Babi Nation. My father is Joseph Alec Sr. My mother is Louise Alec, and I'm from the Bear Clan. I would like to acknowledge the Lake Litanair territory that I'm speaking from. And I would like to thank Lake Babin for the information that they have taught me. Wetland is really important to us and I like talking about wetland, because, but um, we've always been concerned about wetland. We've always um, we've always knew that there was uh, this was important. I grew up knowing this was important to us. I grew up knowing that uh, all the things that are are within wetland, the wetland area. We've, uh, the, the wetlands been drying out within. I'm from the Lake Babi Nation. And if you look up the Lake Babi Nation, um, it's a smack dab in the middle of British Columbia. We've got a really big territory. And most of our, communities are along Babin Lake. Babin Lake is 110 miles long from east to west. And it's the largest lake in British Columbia, natural lake in British Columbia. So our communities start from Fort Babin and then all the way down like Fort Babin and there's little communities in between for Old Fort, that's where I'm from. And then Patchett and then Donald's Landing at the end. Every one of them have a wetland. Every community have a wetland. So um, when in 2016, we joined uh, the um, SAF uh, and did a proposal as our ind indigenous project to study the wetland. Then I also went to the federal government and got some money of, on West Coast to do the, the um, indigenous part of the wetland. I talked to the, uh, all our indigenous elders and um, we did the study for, on, from, for both. At the time when we started in 2016, there was no act for wetlands. There was no protection. So in 2018, I think that the legislation came out with a wetland. And of course, personally, I thought 
it's not enough. It's not enough to protect the wetlands. In the urban areas, they really don't care about their wetlands. You see um, the wetlands being filled and buildings are built on top of it and roads are built on top of it. And then you start to wonder what was there first? How many birds were there? How many fish were there? How many mammals? How many animals? Like what did they destroy? And so around our area with the, the, the Skina group that I'm involved in, they've really got into the wetland and I'm so proud they did because even in our area, it, it's not urban. They're not building houses. They're not uh, doing, uh, getting the wetland out of the way for something, but there's industries. There's industries within the, uh, our area that are, are building roads that are um, clear cutting around the wetlands and the wetlands are so not protected. They have a buffer zone, they call it. And to me, that's not enough because it's not protected and it's drying out. And that is really a big concern to our people. We need the wetlands because that's where, like I say, that's where our, our fridge is. When we, we need something, we go out to get it in the wetlands. When we need meat, we go to the wetlands. When we need um, med medicine, you go to the wetlands because they've got the different medicine that you need. Uh, so that's not protected against the industries. It's, it's not protected against them mostly because they're, they're clear cutting and then they're, they're spraying. They say that the sprays are not harmful, but yet why is it that some of the plants are dying? Why is it that um, some of the animals are dying? So lots of studies need to be done on the wetlands. When we, uh, when we need to go, go, uh, go to get some meat, they just go to the wetlands. And way back then in the past, when you went there, there was always a moose or two or, or something like that. Not anymore, because they're, they're leaving too, because of the clear cuts. There is no more, nothing for them to eat. There is no more for them, no more places for them to hang out. They go to the wetlands because there's a plant in the wetland that they like. You go into the wetlands and you look and the mooses are standing there with their head buried in the, in the lake. They're eating something at the bottom of the, of the wetlands. And the wetlands are beautiful. You go in there and you sit in there, minus the, the, the mosquitoes, they're beautiful. You can't just take something and think that everything is still gonna be the same. You lose something in our circle of life, then something else dies. My elders told me, even a mouse is important. Nobody really likes mice, but they said it, even a mouse is important. A, my, a mouse feeds something else and that, that bird or whatever it fed feeds something else. That's the chain of life. You need everything to be working together. You can't just not like something and then, um, everything is still gonna work. Our ch uh, chain of life is really being disrupted, whether it's in the wetlands or anywhere. Our chain of life is being um, on the back burner so that industries can keep going. We need to make decisions. Are we gonna be, um, allow this to happen and then we don't have anything left? We have a, uh, a mine that is trying to, they're trying to set up a mine within our territory. And they, they took this one little lake and said, well, this lake doesn't have anything in it. There's nothing growing, there's nothing in it. So we could use it for um, the garbage that they're gonna put in. 
How could a lake not have anything? What goes to the lake, that lake to feed? What is in that lake? It may not be big fish. It may not be anything, but a frog, even a frog is important. So that lake is still important. So same with wetlands. You can't say that it's, that it's not worth anything. It, look at it. It's, it doesn't even look good, but that's them. To me, I'd like to just go out there and float around in a boat and just listen to nature. You go in there and you listen to nature. You can hear the birds. You can hear the beaver. Uh, you sit there and then all of a sudden the beaver flaps its tail. You can, there's a little white bird, really tiny, that is always hanging around in the wetlands. And they are so cute that it is just, these things you don't see. You don't see it away from the wilderness. You have to go there. And wetland is not just around, around the lake. They're not only around the lake. You go up in your territory and you go in the back, you find some, but then they change them and uh, they call them salt licks. But around it is all like wet and it's, it's wetland. So we don't live in a box, the First Nations people. We don't th see th things in a box. Like everybody says, well, this is right here and it's in its own th place. This is right there. We don't do that. Everything is always going around in circles. Everything helps the other thing. Everything is hand in hand with all everything that is in, in our nation, in our area. We have to be really careful because when we talk about all the destruction and everything that um, is hindering our survival, we have to think of ourselves like our human being, we as human being. We, money is the root of all evil, I guess. Everybody wants money. So you don't care what you run over. You don't care what, what, um, what we, uh, what we destroy in the process. When way back, I come from Old Fort. You can't live in Old Fort in the winter. They took us away from there. Um, my dad moved away from them. He there. He was the last one to hang on to Old Fort. But they kept taking us. He had twelve kids. They kept taking us one by one to residential school, and he had uh, two more girls, the last ones, and he. At the time, he was trying to make it um, because there was uh, an agreement with uh, Indian Affairs that they get cattle, and that was all over BC. So he got a couple of cattle, and he made that into quite a few cattle, and he worked it. But when it came to his last two girls that they were going to take, he sold everything. He sold everything and moved out, out of Old Fort. And he moved over to Pachet, which is close to Grand Isle, because that's where the school were. So it became like a ghost town. You can't get there by, by car. You, can't, you can only get there by boat. So you, right now, we're all over the place. I'm in Prince George. Some of the members are are in Burns Lake, Grand Isle, uh, Smithers. But in the summertime, we all go back. And as long as we can stay there, we stay as long as we can. And we live the way we're supposed to. We live off the land. We live off, uh, off um, getting our food. Like the only thing we bring to Old Fort would be um, rice and potatoes and and way back then dad my dad used to have a garden he really made it but with us we lived uh, we just bring those and then we live off the land we go and set the net we go and we've been teaching the kids that for as long as I can remember after mom passed away we kept 
doing that. We bring them home and teach them how to hunt. And they all know how to eat moose meat and fish and that. So that's what we do. But where do we get our, our food supplies from? The wetlands. Because it's so much part of us. The kids all know where to go when it comes to going hunting. They have different names like Kanchak and Tledak, uh, Nezalga. Those are the places, Indian names for the places where the wetlands are. And we don't go into another community's area. We believe that we're all Ford members. We have our own areas around there. We don't need to go elsewhere because that's not allowed. We were taught that you cannot go, even though we're from the same nation, we cannot go to another place and do our hunting and gathering. There is a lot of uh, endangered species in the wetland. That's, we, uh, in our study, it didn't, it didn't uh, consider all of the wetlands within our territory. Our territory is big, but at the time when we started the study, the uh, gas line pipeline, they, they gave the money. So it had to be where they were building the pipelines. That's where we studied the, our wetlands. But the more important ones, I guess uh, all the communities consider their, their area the more important ones. I consider mine the more important one because we use it all the time. Um, I would love to just study it some more. It's always funding. There is always the, the, the thing for funding. You have to have funding to do, do the study. But I would love to see like the little bird I'm talking about. The little bird, is that endangered? And we've got uh, muskrat, which people just kill because they think there is nothing, like nothing for it. Our people ate the muskrat. So that was um, done in potlatch. Like people, potlatch is very important within, with our nation. And for way back then when they were gonna have a potlatch, they, it wasn't as extravagant as it is now. They had to go and, and trap and uh, fish and everything. Right now with our family, when we're gonna do something, we do, um, dry, dry fish, uh, dry strips, dry moose meat, moose meat strips, everything like things like that, that we want to pass around. That's and the newfangled angle nowadays is canned, canned fish, sorry. Trying to turn it off. So Where was I? But uh, I talked about the medicine. Um, You're talking about the potlatch, Evelyn. Oh yeah, potlatch. <laughs> and it's very important. And everything that we get is from the land. And it used to be more way back then. They used to, uh, there is only one guy that I know that when he does a potlatch, he goes trapping and he goes hunting and everything that he, he brings. He brings, uh, he got off the land and I'm so proud of him. And he's not old. He's younger than I am. And I'm not old, <laughs> just kidding. Um, but uh, I'm so proud of him because he takes it off the land and that's the way it's supposed to be. Uh, nowadays, it's all new ideas and it's changed. But back in the day, if we could go back, back to the way it used to be, that's the way it should be. Um, so I would like, like when you go to the city, uh, especially in Richmond area, um, and you see all those, uh, the, the city being built, the city growing, and that's all on wetland. And it's sad 
Like it's so sad to see, but they need room. They need room, just like we're out up in the in the north and we're even uh, that even it's reaching us like the, the developments it's reaching us and it's for the industries i always say when you when i go home when we used to go home it was nice and green you could look around and it was nice and green so when we go home we go go from topley like from burns lake to topley prince george burns lake topley then you turn on 118 and then you go go down to old fort so when you turn on 118 and you get down at topley you used to see green now and then it started that there was a, a clear cut so it turned brown and it was just like you know when a lava flows when a volcanic volcano goes uh, erupts the lava flows and that's the way it was like right down babin lake and right from uh, south of ba uh, south babin lake and it just kept flowing and it's flowing right now when i go home it's past old fort and it's all brown and it's all cut and it's just like, uh, and then at the same time, the animals seem to go with it. We used to have abundance of moose, not anymore. And then the, everybody keeps breaking the chain, chain of the cycle. Uh, government went and planted uh, elk in our area because we never had elk. And now elk is just, just increasing all over our territory and it seems like the moose and the elk don't get along so moose keeps moving and then the elk takes over so there's a lot of things that everybody is trying to change and the elders say that we're losing everything because they they're trying to change the cycle they're trying they're trying to when you try to change something and then something else might reject it. I don't know if anybody would agree with me, but that's what we believe. Believe Whatever they're planting into in our area, it's like, it's like a body. If you have a liver transplant, sometimes your body rejects it. That's the same thing. You're transplanting something within the territory. Other things reject it. This is, I'm not a scientist. I just live in our territory and I, and I follow what my mom and dad taught me and they followed what their mom and dad taught them. And we never had police or anything. We never had uh, big halls or anything like that. We have a hall, but it's not as big as everybody, but it's, it's something that we have. Um, there's just the way everything is set, they don't consider what is the consequences of doing this change. What is the consequences of the logging and not having the right buffer zone and it's destroying our wetlands? What's the consequences of, of doing um, a clear cut when they change the flow of the river or creeks? They change the flow of those creeks and it doesn't flow where they're supposed to. And it's get to the point that when they clear cut everything, the sun dries up the creek. The water is just sinking into the earth and the water is not running where it's supposed to. They change everything. So right now, Lake Babine has a lake that is full of beavers, where the beavers are supposed to be up in the forest. Their homes have been destroyed. So now they're all in the lake. We can't eat that many beavers because we can't shoot anything that we can't eat. We can't shoot the beavers if they're, they're a menace to the lake. So we are told 
don't kill anything unless you're going to eat it. So all of us, most of us believe so we don't. So they're havoc to our nets, they're havoc to things that we live by. So, but what can you do? Because the world is changing. And what happens to my fridge if the, the legislation or rules doesn't change? Everything is going to dry out. All the animals are going to leave or they're going to die. And what, are, what happens to us? So everything that, that the industries come, our lake is polluted, for especially where we're living, because we have a mine right across. It's, it's not going anymore, but uh, the garbage that they left behind flowed into the lake and contaminated our lake. So if you go fishing down by that mine, you get deformed fish. And uh, some of them are deformed inside, some of them are deformed outside. So we can't eat our char from there, we can't eat our, our trout from there. And trout is so delicious. We have to get it elsewhere. And it's just, right now we have a, um, a lake just on um, up from Babine Lake. It's called Morrison Lake. That is a pristine lake. That's where they're trying to build them the mine and we're saying no. So far, we're, we're winning. We don't want that lake to be contaminated. We're trying to protect some of the things and all for the sake of money, the industries want to get in there. But so far we're holding our own because we're trying to protect. And also if I can get a, a, a lot stronger with the wetland, Morrison Lake, right past the Morrison Lake is all wetlands. If there is such a thing to protect, have a big protection on wetland, then we can protect our lake. It's so important um, to us. It just, you go, you go up there, even towards Morrison Lake, there is a big wetland area. And you go in there as far as you can and you sit there and you can, it's just like uh, Moose City there. And of course, we don't kill all the moose and we try to get everybody to stay away from there. You can get what you need. You can't overdo it. Um, we go as a family and there's a lot in our family and to do our winter winters, especially now with the COVID. This year, I found a lot more people going to do their, their um, gathering that I've never seen before. We always did it every year. We do our gathering and then we share it with the rest of the family. So this year, people I've never seen came and did their gathering, which is good because COVID is going up again and probably locked down. And if, um, if um, hopefully it never happens that the, the food, food train gets stopped, we're ready. Like we've got all our traditional foods and I would go out and I would help people. Um, but it's so important. I don't know how much, how more stressed I would make it that, that the wetlands are so important. Uh, who are we to destroy that? Who are we as human beings to destroy things that God has set before us? We need to protect it. That's all I ever want to do is protect that. I always think that people must think I'm really crazy, like fighting over, they used to call it wasteland. Like that's how people refer to it. But to me, it's not wasteland. It's, it's very important, very important to our people that they stay up, 
so that we have our stores to go to. Um, yeah. I think I've repeated myself so many times here. Evelyn, that has been amazing. Um, just a quick question for you. I just have a question. I think we have a couple questions in the in the chat box. Have you have you noticed within your community a lot of the younger generation picking up these skills as well? Like, have you noticed an interest in in people who are you know born later wanting to to do the hunting and the gathering traditionally? We like even way holy cow way back. We started taking uh, students from our community in Wayeni, and that's not near our, our traditional territory. The government just went and bought land and made a reserve out of it and moved our people there. We took some students from there and we started um, teaching them our, the way we gather food. And we did that every year with different kids and those kids now, are hunters and gatherers, every one of them. And then it got too costly because we we're just doing it because we're supposed to. So we are my, my grandchildren, I have seven grandchildren, but in our tradition, you're, uh, there is no great aunt. So you, when you become a great aunt, you become a grandma. So I have a lot of kids that I'm a great aunt to, so I'm a grandma. So they all call me grandma. And every year we go home and we, we teach, like my, my mom started teaching my, grand, my kids when they were five to go down and um, start working on the net, bringing fish up, washing fish. And even when they get bigger, they go into the smokehouse, they do moose meat, they do dry meat. And it's been going on for a long time. Ever since my mom passed away, I started doing that because she used to do it. So my mom and dad said, don't let the kids forget about where they come from and who they are. So that's our biggest motto. Remember who you are and where you come from. So we make sure that they learn to eat wildlife. They learn to eat fish. Um, they don't like it, but they have to try it at least once. And a lot of them, they like boiled fish and rice. They like moose meat, moose meat and roll oats. It's, um, they just like moose meat stew and stuff like that. And I'm so grateful for that. Um, but that's, we, we teach them. And we're not the only ones. We have other um, members that come back to the community. They bring their grandkids and they, they do the same thing. And I'm so proud of them. That's amazing. That's an amazing experience for a child. Um, mm -hmm. Molly, there's a couple questions in the Q&A. Did you wanna ask them on the people's behalf? Hmm. Uh, we have one question for you, Evelyn, from uh, Neha and they ask, uh, was the traditional use study done um, for the coastal gas link project, um, the pipeline that came in? There was, uh, there's a, quite a few studies within our nation. There was a tr traditional use study and there's a traditional ecological study. Um, right now, our nation is into other studies and um, I was involved with Involved with a tr tr traditional ecological study. I really wanted to do a book on that, but um, as usual funding, but I always think about like how to do that. That would be so nice to have a book. Lake Babine, as big as they are, we have 2,500 members and we only have one book called Chas Dinkat, which is sold in the universities and that. And it's on, on our potlatch system. So, but uh, yeah, we've had the, the, the TOS when the pipeline was there. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question we have is from uh, Barbara. She says, I live in the North Okanagan and we work with the uh, um, Sepukmen, Sepukmen people. Um, I don't think I pronounced that correctly. Sequipment. Sequipment, thank you. I think. Um, to protect small wetlands there. 
I have a place in uh, Grenada that I visit in the summer, and I was wondering if anyone act was actively working to protect the wetlands in these areas that you're talking about. Um, there is really no protection. Like uh, with us, um, like I said, uh, we, we did this study. And when we started, there was really no act to protect wetlands. But um, we know within our territory, if there's gonna be uh, some sort of development now, they have to go to Lake Baby Nation. And in our traditional use study and ecological study, we've got areas where we are protecting. So when they need to do, do some uh, indus uh, industries, have to come to Lake Babin and ask if they can um, build something. We had a lodge, there, uh, somebody was trying to build a lodge and it was right in there, really close to uh, wet, our wetland, our wetland area and a hunting uh, and fishing area. So we had, it's not, it's crown, crown land they call it, but we still went against, against it and we won. So I'm so proud of it. So we do try to protect, protect uh, where the wetlands and hunting areas are. Um, and we have one more question from Pat Meldrum, um, and she asks, uh, where would you recommend or where have you applied for funding as an individual um, for the projects that you were talking about? We have, uh, like it came from the government, um, it's um, all over BC and um, Oh God, I can't remember. Anyways, uh, we had an indigenous uh, project within that uh, within our Skeena area, and they've got one in um, down south. There, there's six of them, I think, and north, south, uh, the, um, the the coast, and that's how uh, we we put an indigenous project a project to study the wetlands, and that's where we got the money. But when I was doing it. I went through a West Coast uh, West Coast grant through the um, I can't remember, but they helped us to do do our indigenous part, like doing the, the indigenous study to study the wetlands and what the elders had to say about the wetlands. That's where I got the money, um, but it was mostly through. Um, the, the Skeena, Skeena um, group, uh, which I don't know if it's going to go anymore this year, but uh, it's something that um, we had been going for about five years uh, with this government. So um, it, it was started by the pipeline and then it kind of dropped the pipeline and then the government started doing it on their own. All right, thank you. Uh, I have another question from Kyle. Um, he says, um, I used to work in Vanderhoof working with sturgeon on the Nachaco and Stewart rivers. I've never seen a more beautiful area with so many moose. With the size of the Lake Babine Nation territory, is it challenging to fight for wetlands across such a large expanse? Yes, it is. Um, nobody even, it wasn't on anybody's radar, but it's always been something that we always protect but right now it's gotten so that the Skeena area are, is studying wetlands within the whole Skeena region so I'm hoping that when this is finished that there is going to be a lot of information on that when it's done but uh, within our nation uh, we brought it up so that when something um, comes near anywhere in our territory, they deal with it. So that's how we're dealing with it right now. Amazing, thank you so much, Evelyn, um, for sharing your, your knowledge and your experiences with everybody. Um, 
Thank you so much. I think we're that's it for questions. Um, we're going to move on to Genevieve. Genevieve is going to talk about uh, wetland archaeology. So Evelyn, you're more than welcome to stay on and, and watch Genevieve's presentation. But if you have other things that you need to do, then I have I have an AGA that's happening right now for our nation. OK, so I ask for an hour off uh, like I'm an employee. Right? Uh, yeah, so I yeah. ask for an hour. Okay. Thank you so well. Thank you so much for making the time to join us and uh, have an excellent morning. And um, we wish you well, and and we hope to hear from you soon. Okay, bye, Evelyn. Thank you so much. Uh, so, without further ado, I would like to welcome Genevieve. Uh, Genevieve works for the BC Royal Museum, and she is going to be talking us to us about archaeology, specifically in wetlands. Hello, everyone. Apologies for the in and out. I You might hear some um, little babies shrieking with delight in the background, hopefully not crying. Um, I am doing this from home, as many of you are, so I apologize if I look a little bit scattered. Um, I am speaking to you today from the traditional territory of the Lekwungen speaking people in Songhees and Esquimalt territory. Um, I'm also quite close to the Saanich nations. Um, and I was lucky enough to be born in Flaidli Tene territory and raised in Couch and territory. And I'm so grateful for all of those experiences and how they've helped shaped me. Um, so I just wanna say at the beginning of this that none of this work would be possible without um, uh, my work with Couch and Tribe. So I really give great thanks to them. Um, thank you, uh, BCWF, for inviting me to this, and thank you to the RBCM for allowing me to participate. Um, the purpose of, of the work that I do is to understand human activity in the past, um, and I think it's important for me to situate myself a little bit in this. So as I go, I'm going to start out with a little bit about how I came to this work, and um, then I'll get into some more specifics. And then towards the end of this talk, we'll get into some extreme specifics about archaeology uh, and how and how it can fit in with your project. So let me reach one thing. Okay, let me try and share my screen. Mm -hmm. Let's try that one. Sorry, it's just asking me for some preference things, which I'm allow. Uh, it's telling me that I have to quit Zoom for that. Oh. I'm doing this on a Mac. I don't know if this. Uh... Uh, I'm also on a Mac, so it shouldn't be an issue, but let me see if we can. Sorry, everyone, this is a good time to stretch your legs. So I get organized. Let's try this again. Oh, here we go. Okay. Let's try that. Can you guys see that all right? Yes, yes, we can. I'm just going to try and go to presenter mode if I can get there. Um, Should be under slideshow. Okay. Okay. So here we are. Um, I, as I said, I grew up in um, Couch and Territory for the most part, and it has some beautiful estuaries. If you haven't been there, I highly recommend once COVID is over that you take a nice trip down to Couch and Bay and just um, revel in the splendor that is its beautiful estuary. Um, my research began back uh, sort of actually it formed in the first year of my university. I went to UVic studying Greek and Roman studies and anthropology, but basically I was just trying to get as much archaeology as I could. And um, the first field project that I ever did was in at Lake Stymphalos in Greece. So it's in the in the northern Peloponnese. Um, this is a view of their Acropolis. So if you 
can look down to the bottom left, you can sort of start to see some walls there. Um, but obviously the thing that dominates this photo is the beautiful wetland. And that interesting curve that you see in the, in the vegetation there follows along a wall that actually was built out into the wetlands. And this site is really interesting because um, it's, it floods seasonally, um, but the actual uh, town that was there is really significant. It's got um, temples, it had a temple to Athena, or sorry, a temple to Artemis there on the top. Um, it has a, a theater that's carved into the rock down below. It had a working fountain house, like a fountain house that's working 2000 years after it was first built with icy, icy cold water. It was really spectacular. Um, and of course the people who were excavating it were mostly focused on the built environment. They were mostly focused on you know, what are the features that are here that tell us about how people interacted with this place. But what I noticed is that although the wetlands dominate this area, they didn't really do a lot of interpretation based on a relationship to wetlands. So anyway, this set me up for a lifelong interest in archaeology, obviously, as well as um, uh, a sort of a question in my mind, like, if this is such a big feature, why aren't people talking about it more? I should say that this site is also famous because of the um, the legend of Heracles or Hercules. Um, you might, if you're familiar with that one, you might know the um, the Stymphalian birds, which were these big birds that eat men, and they have like the head of a woman and the body of a bird, and they're supposed to be quite terrible. Um, but they were said to come from this from this spot. So it's very significant. But again, given that it was a, a notable spot, the wetlands didn't really factor into that. So then after that, I finished my undergrad at UVic and my first um, commercial archeology span job was for um, a project uh, in downtown Victoria across the harbor from um, what you think of as Victoria proper and what we would call Vic West on the old Songhees Reserve, which was actually a relocated uh, area um, from Songhees who were living downtown, downtown. They were um, displaced. And um, uh, there, there's also um, other areas around town and people were coming towards the fort to trade. So there was actually a lot of uh, different indigenous communities that were living here on this reserve. The particularly interesting thing about this is that um, we were part of a monitoring project um, that was um, taking place before a, a big high rise development. And so our job was just to go through, we were working with Songhees members, we're going through and just raking things out of the soil. And we were getting lots of, you know, historic material, broken glass and nails and things like that. Um, but uh, toward the end of the project, the excavator operator was just clearing out what they thought were um, sterile soils. And they put their, their bucket right through uh, an old shaft and the shaft was lined with barrels old wooden barrels. So we have barrel staves. Um, and in the shaft were hundreds of waterlogged shoes and waterlogged pieces of basketry. And this is all very significant. There was a bent wood box. There was a halibut hook that was carved in the shape of a seal with a little halibut's tail coming out of its mouth. Um, fish hooks, all sorts of things uh, that really speak to the history of Songhees and other nations that were here at this time. And Nobody knew what to do. Nobody. You know, I was working, this was my first archaeology job. I was working for um, people who I considered professionals and nobody knew what to do. So this was a pretty big shock to the system. And this is what sort of kicked me off on looking at um, waterlogged objects and wetland sites. So two caveats at this point. Um, the rest of my education, although I study this stuff, I still don't consider myself an expert in it. I just happen to have a lot of experience working with uh, the archeology span in both academic and commercial disciplines. And so my talk about this is not from a point of expertise 
in the culture, but rather an expertise in the culture of archaeology and how it's applied to cultural sites. The other caveat is that um, I will talk a lot about wet sites and wetland sites. And although the two are frequently found together, they aren't always the same thing. So you can have a wet site like the one at the old Songhees Reserve, which is a waterlogged uh, sort of spot where water covers objects for enough of the year that they stay wet, or that could be in a wetland because wetlands are naturally like that. So keep that in mind as we proceed. So a wetland as defined by the Ramsar Convention of 1971 is an area of marsh, fen, peatland or water, whether natural or artificial, permanent or temporary with water that is static or flowing, fresh, brackish or salt, including areas of marine water to a depth of which at low tide does not exceed six meters. So when I went to the University of Exeter to study wetland archeology, span I really, um, I wanted to examine uh, wetlands, but I wanted to make sure that the definition was not going to be some very, very tiny thing that was going to exclude everything. I'm more concerned, or I was, I was and am more concerned with how people perceive wetlands uh, in all their forms and how the uh, archaeology, reg uh, archaeology rules sort of um, how they interact with this definition. So here's my broad definition. And this is the working definition that I used for wet site. So wet site is a site in which the matrices and their organic contents are located below the water table and which have become saturated with water. The presence of water creates an oxygen free zone in which bacterial and fungal growth is inhibited. Accordingly, organic material, which would normally perish in a dry land site is preserved in a wet context. Um, what, I can answer some questions a little bit more about the technical aspects later. Um, but for now, this is what most people think of when they think of waterlogged. But for archaeologists, this is what we think of when we think of waterlogged. <clears throat> so uh, in Europe, people are absolutely familiar with waterlogged archaeology um, and what we would call wet sites here on the coast. So this started you know, over 150 years ago with people excavating Swiss lake villages where they noticed all these sorts of like um, standing posts and all these like, uh, if you look down in the bottom left, you can see some sort of wattle type fence down there, which might have been a panel on the side of a, a structure. So they're extensive. Of course, everybody knows about uh, Viking longships. Everybody knows about bog bodies. Everybody knows about these things because those are the things that really capture the um, headlines in European archaeology. And they can tell us absolutely way more than what conventional archaeology can. So this is a photo um, from the BC archives of um, First Nations in BC, and I, I apologize that I did this presentation. I put this together two years ago and I've had, uh, I just have one-year-old twins now. So my brain isn't uh, right there with the name of which community this is from. The point is that if you look through the picture, there's a cradle in the, the standing man's arms, which is made out of perishable material. These structures are made out of, um, Re, you know, cattail tule reeds. Uh, there's stripped cedar, there's textile. So most of what you're looking at in this photo is made out of perishable material. Archaeology in British Columbia, and I have to say North America, and certainly in other parts of the world, is really focused on the dichotomy between marine and terrestrial. And this is a really easy way to explain uh, or to sort of classify archaeological sites, but it's lazy and it's unnuanced and we're missing out on wetlands. So to me, it's the best of both worlds. It's got um, both, you know, like if you look at those two pictures, seals, sea lions, marine creatures that we would call marine creatures come up into wetlands, you know, they hang out there, uh, the things that we would consider terrestrial animals, they go to wetlands to eat, they go to wetlands to drink, 
they go to hang out, you know, these places are, they're, they're their own environment uh, and they're not something that we should be um, overlooking at all. So the purpose of archeology span then to understand human activity in the past. Um, and for me personally, um, looking at uh, these different aspects, social and spiritual, dwelling, resource gathering and transportation. And again, this is just a lazy way to classify the entire breadth of people's experience who live and work in these wetlands. So here are some examples that are just, uh, they're not necessarily from British Columbia, but they're just meant to highlight the sorts of things that can be found uh, in wetlands and, and wetland environments. Um, this is uh, Seahenge, um, which is on the northeast coast of Britain. Um, and it, it is a really interesting henge feature like you know, in the tradition of Stonehenge, this one is particularly interesting because the stump is upturned in the middle of uh, the sea henge and all of the pieces of timber are cut vertically and are put diametrically opposed to one another within the circle. Um, and of course you have to be able to look at the wood and actually know about the wood in order to identify this. And if this wasn't in a waterlogged context, it would just disappear and we'd never know that it existed. Uh, here's an example from Scotland. This is a Cranog, um, and these were quite common uh, domestic structures where a, 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 a living space, a house is put over top of stilts out in the water. Um, and there are various speculations, whether it's for defense or access or, you know, all sorts of reasons. But these leave uh, quite a significant signature because you both have the structure itself as well as um, the things that people chuck over the edge. So there's sort of a ring of, of things that people throw off the edge. Um, of course, transportation, there's tons and tons of people finding long boats and other, other kinds of boats all over um, Europe. And uh, access, this is um, the sweet track in Glastonbury. <clears throat> And this is a series of um, tracks that go out into the wetland itself. Um, researchers there like to talk about how um, this was sort of penetrating a liminal space and there were deposits of culturally significant um, objects like ax heads and stuff that were deposited at the ends of these trackways that just sort of terminate out in the wetland with no other um, destination. Um, so they're looking at these both as access through a wetland, but also sort of a significant spiritual um, practice of going out there and depositing these ritual offerings. So if we, if we stop to think about what's happening here, you know, like Europe, yeah, everybody knows about wet sites in Europe. And I would argue that they're slightly more uh, ready to deal with them and do them justice. But out here, um, what my research, I guess I should stop and say that my research, I was really looking at how the perception of wetlands, um, how, how the Western perception of wetlands as uh, wastelands and as spaces that need to be um, drained and used for agriculture has really negatively impacted, impact, negatively impacts the way that the legislation was written. And as a course of that, it impacts the way that it's taught in schools. And, um, and so for a long time, people weren't finding wet sites. And when they were, they were finding wet sites and they were just sort of losing their minds. They're like, oh my God, this is so crazy and important and expensive and scary and we don't know what to do. So, so um, the biggest notable site here on the coast for now um, is Ozette, Washington in, in Washington state. So the village of Ozette, um, the village of Ozette uh, is a coastal village, sort of, if you think of the, the, the Olympic Peninsula, I think it's at the top little point there. Um, the village itself was unfortunately covered by a mudslide. And, um, and so, you know, houses that were standing vertically were just sort of 
uh, toppled in that and covered over with um, a really dense mud. And then aquifers that existed in the village were still sort of pumping this fresh water through the village and sort of getting rid of a lot of oxygen. And of course, uh, everything was preserved beautifully. So in the seven, 60s and 70s, when they started to excavate this site, um, they were finding all sorts of things that you never really find in what we consider classic archaeology sites on the coast. When you think of archaeology in North America, you think of stone, bone, and shell, you think of hunting and gathering, um, you think of um, fishing, um, but there's a whole host of things that people weren't thinking about, people weren't learning about, and archaeologists weren't learning to identify or to recover or to analyze. So at Ozette, the significance is that, um, oh, I should say that this is a photo of the site being excavated by a series of hoses and water pressure, which is um, actually a really effective way to excavate sites. Um, and Dale Crows, uh, one of the researchers down there, um, is holding up a piece of a basket that was recovered from the site. And behind him, you can see he's mapping the zone and all those little white tags are uh, perishable objects. Um, so that's things made of um, primarily of wood, of uh, fiber, plant fiber, skin, things like that. So um, that's a significant number of objects just in that one shot behind him. Um, the white things that you see are plastic and I, only presume that they're covering things like house posts there. So the significant thing about the Ozette excavation was that um, when they stopped to count up the number of objects that they had found at the site, what they realized is that the stone, bone, and shell um, that we associate with Northwest Coast sites or with North American sites predominantly only formed 5% of the assemblage. 95% of the material that they recovered from this site was made out of perishable material. So 95% versus 5%. This is really problematic because, um, because the way that archaeology is taught to people in, in uh, British Columbia, certainly, and throughout North America, is that um, they're making they're making conclusions about historical cultures based on that 5% of material. And that, you know, like that's trying to imagine what your life is like based only on your keys, your glasses, your shoes. But that really doesn't capture the essence of you and your culture, does it? So that was a major, a major turning point. And I'm, you know, I think more and more archaeologists are now trained to, um, you, you know, they're at least introduced to the idea of um, Ozette, but they're still taught that that's like a rare thing. And this is something that we're trying to work past. This is just one of the incredible examples of things that were recovered from the Ozette site. So this is a box lid that is in it's in the shape of a whale's fin and it's inlaid with otter teeth and you can actually see um, a bird on there and um, it's an incredible incredible piece so um if you think about that number of 95 percent versus the five percent um an example from the archaeology collection at the royal bc museum is that we have over 215,000 objects in our collection currently, uh, but that only represents 5% of what those sites yielded originally, of what people were using on those sites. So that only represents 5% uh, of the 4,300,000 objects that would have potentially originally been in use by these cultures. So if we are trying to do any sort of research, we really have to start looking to wet sites to answer some questions because using that 5% is just not gonna cut it. Um, I'm just looking here at my notes and of the, um, I think this is something that I uh, extracted from the archeology span branch database. Uh, of the 48,723 recorded archeological sites, only 56 are listed as wet sites, which is less than 0.1%. Um, 
we'll get into these numbers a little bit later, but that's pretty ludicrous. I mean, as Evelyn said, everybody goes to the wetlands to, you know, it's like the grocery store. Um, everybody knows how bioproductive they are. Everybody knows how um, special they are. I mean, I don't have to convince you guys of that because you're here, but um, uh, there are certain factions of the uh, regular um, population that need to be uh, educated and convinced. So archaeology in BC is the great unknown. Most of the archaeology that takes place in British Columbia is development driven. So that means that people obtain permits um, before they do something like this, put in a highway. This I think is the uh, South Fraser Perimeter Road. I worked on a site that's just um, just a little bit off screen to the right. Um, so 97% is development driven and approximately 3% is research, which is a shame. Um, but then again, as Evelyn said, a lot of a lot of this has to do with funding, uh, almost entirely has to do with funding. And so these research projects are funded by institutions like um, uh, the Hakai Institute and, uh, you know, big federal grants and things like that. So um, we have to look at the history of archaeology in British Columbia. So a bit of a crash course is that the first sort of proper excavations, what we think of as uh, archaeological excavations where people were keeping notes and, and uh, doing some sort of rough systematic excavation, and I mean really rough, is uh, the first excavations are taking place in the mid 1800s. Um, I believe this is a picture of Sasnam, which is uh, also known as the Great Fraser Midden. Um, and it's unfortunate, one, one of the um, people who excavated here, I think it was Harlan Smith, had said in one of his field notes, that he kind of expected to find some perishable material because uh, part of Sasnam was um, water saturated, but he didn't find anything. And I can't help but wonder if that really changed the trajectory of archeology span in British Columbia to a certain extent. Um, it was about the same time that the Swiss Lake villages were being excavated in Europe. Um, a big thing for archaeology in British Columbia is, um, is the use of ethnographic sources and what we call the direct historical approach. Uh, here we have a couple of white guys who, um, who had done a lot of ethnographic work. We've got Franz Boas um, on the left, and he is, is very well known for coming here and um, doing a lot of research that was well-renowned. Um, it's, it's problematic as well. Um, I'll get into that a little bit later, but um, the use of ethnographic sources uh, was a way to uh, look at what's happening in the archaeological record and see what people had recorded, because of course the idea was that um, for Westerners arriving and documenting Indigenous cultures here, they really thought or believed that they weren't going to survive and so they had to record everything. And obviously we know this is absolutely not true. The other thing is the direct, direct historical approach, which is a way of looking at what's happened in the recent past and then sort of extrapolating backwards. So they would look at um, what was recorded in this early ethn ethnographic uh, source material and say, well, they were hunting this species. And so we can assume that going back, if they were hunting this species with this tool, it goes back and back and back. So if we find this tool a thousand years ago, or sort of in that, in that layer, then we can assume they're hunting the same thing. Um, and again, the direct historical approach is extremely, extremely problematic. Um, I should say during this period of time, although some uh, quasi archaeological work was being done, um, it was all the protection that existed from the early colonial governments was just about objects and not about um, site significance, cultural significance, and it certainly didn't uh, protect these in order to protect them for the communities or the descendant communities. It was entirely sort of a museum 
looking to gather objects and they wanted it to protect from other museums, you know. So this is a picture of Charles Borden, um, who worked at UBC. Um, he taught German, he actually wasn't a, an archaeology prof. Um, but he was the first to really start to do systematic archaeological work. Um, and you can see on the, the uh, tool that's in his hand, there's actually a label. So this is when we start getting into like really technical um, recording of where things come from, what the context is. Then in the 1960s, you get the Archaeological Sites Advisory Board, and this is the first body that starts to record sites. Charles Borden was really concerned that development was destroying archaeological sites, and so started to uh, encourage others to really record them as, not record them so that they could be protected, but record them as they were being destroyed in a way. So um, 60s saw people taking an interest in sites and recording the sites themselves. And in the 70s, you see large provincial surveys take place. Uh, these provincial surveys were funded by the province and I believe federally, um, but they weren't systematic. So you had some people walking around on land, you had other people going around on boats looking for sites, but they were by and large looking for things that they could see with the naked eye. So they weren't doing in-depth community consultation at that point. Um, they may have heard from locals about things and they may have talked to Indigenous community members, but that wasn't part of the program. And then in the 1980s, you start to get commercial archaeology. So we're starting to, to look at things like um, uh, culturally modified trees are starting to, uh, starting to sort of um, factor in the archaeological mindset and people are starting to look for these things. This happens in the 1990s. Um, and throughout all of this, we've moved from the stone, bone and shell. We've now incorporated culturally modified trees, um, but we're still really focused on objects and identifying sites, but not cultural landscapes and certainly not wetlands. So we come to the present day and our Archaeology is governed by the Heritage Conservation Act. Um, the purpose of the act is to encourage and facilitate the protection and conservation of heritage property in British Columbia. The Heritage Conservation Act gives automatic protection for all sites that predate 1846, whether they're known or unknown. Post-1846 sites are protected by designation, so you'd have to sort of say that this is a significant site. Uh, you have to put in an application to prove it. And alteration to a site requires a permit. The Heritage Conservation Act itself is supported by the archaeology branch guidelines and bulletins. So <clears throat> um, there's a couple of things here which are worth noting. 1846, um, I believe that's the date of the Oregon treaties. It has no bearing whatsoever on cultural significance to archaeological sites. In other parts of the world, people have a 50 year rolling deadline, which makes more sense. Um, but this was a deadline or sort of an arbitrary date that was put into place by a non archaeologist who was actually a heritage developer who wanted to be allowed to develop heritage properties, but protect archaeological sites. So the post 1846 thing, it, it, it only really has a bearing on how the law is applied. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, also, it's worth noting that um, there's big pushes to change this date because by virtue of this date, it's basically cutting indigenous, indigenous cultures off at 1846 and saying like anything before that time is your culture and anything after that time is not really worth uh, noting down. And it also uh, facilitates the erasure of um, communities that arrived in British Columbia and, and helped to build what we know as um, British Columbia, including Chinese, Hawaiian, South Asian communities, uh, Black communities, um, by not automatically protecting their material. Um, we're really doing those communities and their culture history a huge disservice. So wetlands, which is what we're here to talk about. Are the wetlands protected yet? Well, um, sort of. <clears throat> the the big plight of wetland and wet sites in British Columbia is that there's a lack of awareness which directly links to a lack of preparedness. Most 
of the archaeological sites are found by accident. Um, because people aren't anticipating to find them, they're not included in the project budgets for the, from the get-go. So what happens is that someone will encounter a wet site with all of these significant objects and go, oh my god, we don't have any money in the budget to deal with this. Uh, what do we do? So they might recover it or they might cover it back up. Um, so there's all sorts of problems that come out of that. Um, due to the delicate nature of the material, um, perishable material, when you encounter it in a, in a wet site, often has the consistency of like um, damp cardboard. So like it can hold its shape, but it's pretty floppy and it's really uh, vulnerable to scrapes and things like that. So that takes longer to excavate. Uh, people don't know how to do excavation with hydraulic material. You know, hyd when I say hydraulic excavation, I just mean like a hose. <clears throat> it's expensive to conserve um, this material, but that's primarily due to the scarcity of conservation labs. Uh, historically, the only lab that existed in Canada um, that covered this material uh, conservation costs for free was the Canadian Conservation Institute in Ottawa. Um, Kate C. First Nation had a lab for a time, um, and that may start up again at some point, I hope. Um, but there was nowhere on the West Coast to do conservation. Um, so that meant that shipping things was quite expensive and dangerous for the objects. Um, and I'm glad to be able to tell you that the RBCM is finally starting a wet site lab. So, so we're on the up and up there. Um, it's expensive to analyze because there's a small comparative collection and people don't have a lot to compare it with. So they don't necessarily know what they're looking at. Um, and then you have things like wood identification. Again, there's not many people who do that. Um, so that becomes expensive just by virtue of uh, scarcity. Um, but but um, there is a higher emotional impact with artistic pieces, rare pieces, large pieces, quite unique pieces. And I say unique because we haven't found a lot yet, but we may in time. <clears throat> so we're going to talk a little bit about the lack of awareness, why the lack of awareness exists. Um, the, the biggest thing that I identified during my research was that the perception of wetlands is, is um, it's a very Western perspective that is based entirely on the primacy of agriculture. So you know, even the Dutch who are famous for their wetlands are also famous for draining wetlands and trying to turn it into pasture land. So um, yeah, in Western Europe, particularly the, the, the focus on agriculture was translated when people moved to British Columbia and to North America, and they just looked at all this beautiful wetland and thought, oh my God, just think of all the things we could grow in this wetland. <clears throat> that itself has translated into uh, the way that um, people look at archaeology. Uh, I found a document at one point that said, we didn't survey the wetland because it was not suitable for human habitation. And that line really stuck with me because <clears throat> later I found um, a source from a fellow named John Keith Lord, who had been doing a boundary survey in the late 1800s, I think. Um, who said, who actually documented uh, communities in the Sumas Lake area, Sumas Prairie, um, communities living in buildings on stilts in the wetlands. So, you know, um, those sorts of sources are not, uh, are not common. And um, part of the reason that those sources aren't common is because white Westerners who came to North America who didn't like wetlands to begin with, weren't going to spend a lot of time in wetlands documenting what indigenous communities were doing there because they didn't like them. So it's not at all, you know, a lot of people look at ethnographic sources and think like, yeah, they're pretty objective. Um, yeah, they, they recorded a lot of stuff, but you have to think about the cultural biases that these people had. And if you don't like a wetland, um, you're not going to focus your attention on recording what's happening there. You know, these folks were also predominantly trying to record things about resources that they could exploit. Um, you know, they were talking about lumber, they were talking about fish, they were talking about animals. 
um, they were talking about available land. So they were trying to record these things about uh, resources that justified their uh, taking it away from First Nations communities. Um, there's also a lack of education in universities and schools about uh, wetlands in general. And then um, the last thing is that there's, well, this is certainly not the last thing, there's many things, but the last thing that I will talk about um, with regard to lack of awareness is the fact that um, wet sites often have a low visibility as compared to shell midden. A lot of the archeological sites that you uh, would see recorded in British Columbia are shell midden sites that have bright white shell in a really dark matrix and they really catch the eye. You often see them um, as beach, uh, beach heads erode. Um, and yeah, so they look different. They look unique. Uh, when you look at a waterlogged piece of basketry in, um, in a wetland, it's brown on brown on brown. And if you didn't notice uh, the brown on brown in a unique pattern, you might just totally never see it. So because of the low education about this and the low visibility and the assumptions that that uh, Indigenous people weren't there, it's it just sort of a perfect storm for people to, to, to not think about wetland archaeology. I did just want to pop back to my discussion of Western European culture um, and say that also not only were these predominantly men who were recording this information um, and predominantly those guys were not interested in going into a wetland, but also they weren't interested in the roles and activities of women to the same extent. And um, from my uh, research, I've seen that a lot of wetland activity is carried out by women um, gathering plants and things like that. Um, so again, that's not something that these Western men were recording because gathering plants is not something we're interested in exploiting. <clears throat> so, yeah, so the perception of, uh, of wetlands um, influencing archaeological practice, primacy of agriculture. The other thing is that they see water as a barrier. They don't see it necessarily as a method of transportation. You know, nowadays, the youth of today <laughs> they're not used to boats as much as they are used, used to cars or scooters or things on land, of course, but um, that wasn't always the case. Um, but again, it's a Western perception that is that is applied to Indigenous cultural sites, and it's wrong. Um, yeah, and then the not suitable for human habitation. So here's a little case study. This is from the research that I did with Couch and First Nation. Um, uh, this is the location on southeastern Vancouver Island across from Salt Spring. Um, Couch and Bay is sort of down at the bottom of your screen there, and you can see Couch and Bay, Genoa Bay, um, Duncan. Some of you might have been to Duncan or Lake Couch. And um, this is a map of the recorded archaeological sites. Now, I should say, I always stress recorded archaeological sites because. The archaeology that's been done has not been systematic. It has just been based on what people, what Western archaeologists have seen or they've been told about. Um, and you'll notice that almost all of the sites are on or around the coastline. The other thing is that archaeological sites often come up when people are building homes and a lot of people want to build their homes on the coastline. So that means that the, the frequency with which you encounter a, a, an archaeological site on the coast is quite high. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they aren't elsewhere too. It just means that they haven't been recorded elsewhere. So yeah, all these little triangles are recorded archeological sites. Um, and this uh, Cowichan Bay is a huge, huge, huge feature in the landscape. Um, and it is its own thing for sure. Um, the map, the, the, the marshland that is denoted on that map there is just based on um, provincial, um, you know, provincial parceling of different landscape features, but it really extends throughout that whole area. Um, where are we? So um, here are some photographs. Um, I should say that my PhD research was based on uh, looking at whether or not um, these, these wetland features, you know, 
trying to ascertain what the significance of wetland features was to Cowichan people, um, rather than just looking at the archaeological sites. I wanted to see, did those overlap? Did they match? Or was there, um, was there some sort of error between what archaeologists were looking at and uh, what Indigenous communities held to be important? So here is a picture of a fish weir on the Cowichan River. Huge elaborate structures meant to uh, facilitate fish harvesting. Um, they're actually uh, tons of these along the Cowichan River uh, at various points in history and um, have been proven to be quite um, sustainable for fishing. They had panels that could be removed at different periods of, of the year. Um, and the harvesting methods that they used were extremely sensitive. But of course, when Western white um, people moved into the area, they said, oh my God, the Cowichan First Nation are just cutting off all of the supply. And they accused Cowichan people of being insensitive to the fish stocks, which was a total joke. Um, but ultimately the regulations um, from both the federal and provincial governments um, facilitated the destruction of a lot of these sites, which is really unfortunate. The point here is that there were lots of them and it was a huge tradition uh, of great significance. Here's a photo, photo, a series of photos from Edward Curtis, who is a, a white photographer from the um, Washington state who traveled around and was taking some very beautiful photos of um, indigenous communities. However, um, some of the critique of Curtis is that some of the photos were set up and um, that he was still perpetuating that, uh, you know, eventual erasure of in indigenous communities. What's notable here is that he's taken a photo of women and women's activities. And this is called the Thule Gatherers uh, in Cowichan. So here you see a woman actually gathering them in the wetland, and then you see them being laid out to dry before making mats. And these um, Thule mats were used for all sorts of purposes. They were a daily, daily, daily feature of indigenous Cowichan life. Um, they were used for everything from like lining canoes and covering canoes to those temporary shelters that I showed you way back at the beginning. Um, they were used to line longhouses. They were used to store food. They were used everywhere. And archeologically speaking, they're completely invisible unless you get a wet site. I also looked at um, uh, traditional name, pla like place names, um, uh, the toponyms in Cowichan. So this is a map that the Hokaminum Treaty Group has published. Um, and you can see the frequency with which these named places extend all along, not only the coast, but up in along the river and throughout the wetland. So when you stop to think about the places that Cowichan ancestral Cowichan people were actually naming and experiencing and living. The, the, the cover, the, the scope of these sites is way bigger than what the archaeology is showing. So this is a map of um, cultural sites that is based on information that Halkaminum Treaty Group has published. So this isn't including any of the sensitive sites uh, that aren't uh, recorded for public common knowledge. Um, but you can just see that the spread of these sites is like super significant. It goes from the coast all the way up to the lake. Um, and it's quite different than the archaeological sites, which are there. So when I actually started to crunch numbers on this, uh, it seems that for archaeological sites, they assume that 90, or sorry, that 85% of um, cultural sites are along the coastline. And they would say, if you'd read a write-up of Cowichan archaeology, they often say, the Cowichan were a marine oriented community. Well, yes, and they were also a wetland oriented community. Um, and that is highlighted by all those red sites. What I find in the Cowichan significant sites is that 85% are in and around wetland features and not on the coast. So that really helps to sort of reorient uh, your awareness of the significance. So how can we protect wetland sites? We need to reorient our awareness to the significance of these sites. Um, it's so critically important that we work with descendant communities because they 
it's their culture. They have so much knowledge to share. Uh, the impacts are felt um, ever so greatly by those communities, um, even more so than by the communities, the Western communities that have um, implanted themselves into these territories. Um, we need to improve government policy, um, which is currently in the elementary stages. Um, when I say government policy, uh, one of the big changes that we got to make that I got to assist making um, before I left the archaeology branch was that when people put in a permit application, they often have to say what kind of sites they anticipate finding, whether they're going to find culturally modified trees or they're going to find a lithic scatter or whatever. Um, so now they, there's a tick box on that form that says, have you thought about the possibility of encountering a wet site? Are you prepared to do so? So now at least everybody's having to go through that mental exercise of thinking about whether or not there might be a wet site there and being prepared to do that. Um, we need to educate, educate, educate everybody um, and uh, develop local conservation labs. Um, as I said, the, the RBCM, uh, we just hired a conservator who has the ability to conserve waterlogged perishable materials, but we're also hoping in the future to not only develop a, a fully functioning lab, but to be able to help indigenous communities build capacity themselves so that they can do treatments in their own communities and they don't need to worry about um, finding the money to do it uh, through a commercial lab. And then of course we need to communicate our findings. So specifically now, how can archeology span uh, dovetail with your project? Um, always, always, always check for archaeological sites. So many reasons to do this. Um, the one that people don't think about as much is the impact that, you know, the, the, the moral impact to destroying a cultural site or modifying a cultural site. Um, and also the one that people do think about a lot is that if their project gets held up by archaeology, then it's really costly time and money. So it's so important to work with First Nations groups from the get-go. Um, you can also, well, you should also <laughs> consult the archaeology branch. You can ask for, um, you can call this number and um, find out whether or not there are any recorded archaeological sites within the project footprint. Um, Diana Cooper is the woman that you will, will uh, interact with, and she's super, super helpful. So you can ask any questions about um, what are the chances of finding things if it's not recorded, things like that. Um, it's important to look beyond land title, so you can check all the sources like uh, museums and archives, which have everything from written documents that everyone's used to, but also, um, for example, we have at the RBCM the audiovisual, the Indigenous audiovisual collection, which has thousands of photos from different communities that actually show Indigenous people in their community. And what's notable is that in the background of many of those photos, you can see wetland features and how they were used, which actually informs you um, not only what the environment was like at that time, but what sort of um, land use functions to expect and, you know, also how you might um, design your wetland to work with what existed there before. Um, and then, of course, you can look for signs like uh, indicator plants, check soil exposures, crop marks, um, and get things like LIDAR imagery. So here's an example from Britain. They do a lot of crop mark archaeology, and you can see a whole host of <clears throat> roundhouses and ditch features there. Uh, and then this is a really beautiful uh, LIDAR image of Hadrian's Wall in uh, northern uh, northern UK. Um, so you see like Roman fort ditches and um, structures and things like that. Um, particularly LIDAR is particularly excellent for wetland areas because you don't have to worry about um, crazy geology or um, like dense tree cover. LIDAR can penetrate tree cover, but it's always easier if you don't have to worry about that. And then the thing that um, that even people who are familiar with wet, wet site archaeology don't tend to consider is that um, you have to think about the long-term impact to the cultural 
uh, deposits in your area. So what happens to a buried deposit if you change the groundwater table? If you are going to be modifying that in a significant way and there's an archaeological site nearby but not within your footprint, it's still important to consider how that change might impact the ability for that waterlogged deposit to maintain its waterlogged state. Um, if you're going to be adding oxygen, like a bubbler, for example, to uh, a lake, you might want to consider whether or not there are waterlogged archaeological deposits around because once you start adding oxygen, that's going to get them the, the um, uh, you know, the microbes going and stuff that's going to start to, to decompose that material. So um, while a lot of us, you know, I think that the beauty of people who study wetlands is that they understand how embedded they are and how interconnected they are with other aspects of the landscape um, and just uh, it's just that people need to start thinking that archaeological deposits are going to be there too. Um, and while you may not necessarily be able to see them without excavating them, um, there are ways to sort of anticipate what you might find. Um, are you going to change the length of seasonal dry spells? That again will have an impact on, on archaeological materials. Um, and then how can they be mitigated? So avoid, alter, monitor, you know, there's multiple ways around that. And it's always good to discuss this with the indigenous communities that you're working with. So um, this is, I'm just gonna blast through some, some tips here. Um, it's important to plan ahead because every time you have to stop for cultural stuff, um, it's just gonna cause more headaches and cost time and money. So. If there is no site within the footprint of where you want to be doing your wetland restoration or whatever, um, you can proceed, but it's always good to keep an eye out for you, you know, just sort of uh, through speaking to community members, anticipate that you might still find something, even if no site is recorded. Um, in areas with high potential, it's always possible to hire someone to do an overview assessment, which is a non-permitted, non-invasive uh, survey of the area. And that's often based on talking to community members and looking at existing archaeological records in the area. Um, if there is a new site or there is a really high potential, it's sometimes advisable to get or I should say it's always advisable to get an impact assessment, which is called a Section 14 permit under the Heritage Conservation Act. Um, and again, this is something you have to budget for because the archaeologist has to do um, invasive testing. So they'll probably do a series of shovel tests or cores or something like that to identify. Um, if there is a known site within your footprint and it has had previous testing, um, if, it's if it's previously had an impact assessment, then you would need to get a site alteration permit. Um, you can do this, um, but you, again, you have to hire an archeologist and they have to obtain a permit from the archeology span branch. Um, understand the timeline. Right now, permits uh, between application and issuance are taking over 60 days. So that's something to factor into your plans. Um, the cost of doing archaeological work, uh, again, this can be scary, but um, it's so important. Um, I think the thing to stress most is that it's imperative that you pay Indigenous people for their cultural knowledge and time. Um, you can often contact the lands uh, or the archaeology person who works for a, a nation, and they'll give you the rates of their staff. But it's really important to, to actually pay Indigenous communities for their knowledge. A lot of times, Historically, people would assume that Indigenous people would just do this work because it was important to them, but that's, um, it's not the way we do things now. We are, we are, we have to value their knowledge um, in the same way you would pay an archaeologist. Um, these days, archaeologists are charging between 80 to 100 bucks an hour. Uh, make sure that your archaeologists that you hire or consult with is including a post-excavation analysis and reporting in their cost estimate because some companies uh, don't want to scare off groups by, by putting the, the full number out front. So they'll cut off the reporting and analysis. And then once you've excavated the stuff, they go, oh, well, we need a little bit more for this. And it's often a lot more. So make sure that that is included in the, in the cost estimate. And then 
sometimes clever planning can decrease the number of steps required. So um, it's always a good idea. Just you can call someone at the archaeology branch and talk through um, policy. You can always explain that you don't have a lot of cash, but you want to do the right thing. Um, there's always people who will help. And if you're ever in a pinch, you can call me up and I will help walk you through that process. Um, and so why are archaeological sites, wet archaeological sites, so important? I mean, the first thing is that it's not up to us, it's not our culture uh, to determine what's important. It is Indigenous people's culture and we have to be doing the right thing um, and respecting that culture from the get-go. Um, that's not to say that they have to prove it or they have to um, show why it's important. We have to assume that it is important and it's up to them to be telling the stories. Um, there are also specifics like the human footprint that was found in a wet deposit on Calvert Island that's pushing back uh, the dates of human occupation of North America by leaps and bounds. Um, there was another wet site that um, recently recovered waterlogged material from a site that's 14,000 uh, over 14,000 years um, old. So these are like extremely, extremely um, significant sites. Also Monteverde down in South America. Um, these are the sites that are going to answer things about how, um, how long Indigenous people have been here um, for sure since time immemorial. And this, this archaeology is supporting that. So um, it's really our duty to become aware of the importance of this and do these sites absolute justice. So with that, I will finish. And my thanks to the following um, people. Um, I'm really grateful to talk to you and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, we have a couple questions here. The first one is from Marissa um, and she asks, uh, what kind of repatriation efforts is the RBCM undertaking uh, for the pieces you're talking about? Um, sorry, remind me of the pieces. I think this was back when you were speaking about the, uh, for example, the box with the whale tail um, that was recovered. Oh, yeah, that's not actually with us. That's at the Macaw Museum in Washington State. So that's a that's a uh, museum that's run by Indigenous community members. So they have control of all of that material themselves. Um, the RBCM is, um, we're focused a lot right now on repatriating ancestral remains that are in our collection. Um, but all archaeological material that comes to the RBCM is being held in trust. Um, and so as communities develop um, whatever spaces they want to put this material in, if they want to rebury objects uh, within their community, they can do that too. Um, and so, yeah, everything is fair game at the RBCM. And if you have questions, specific questions, we have a repatriation handbook that's available online and you're always welcome to call me and I can talk you through the process. Awesome, thank you. Uh, the next question is um, a bit of a long one, but how accurate do you think the archeological uh, predictive models are in BC with reference to wetlands slash wet sites? I'm working for a nation in Northern BC where I know that many AOA models are out of date and often am engaged on permitting uh, various archeology span work. I'm wondering if you think wetland areas could or should be considered to have higher potential for archeological features slash sites, even when predictive models don't identi identify them to be mo moderate or high priority or potential. Yeah. The short answer is yes. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, a lot of the predictive models are Yes, absolutely out of date, but also um, when I was doing my research, I was looking at the predictive model for the South Island. Um, and I know in speaking to the people who developed it that they weren't including uh, wetland features in that way. Uh, a lot of predictive models are based purely on archeological sites that have already been found. So there's like this negative feedback where, yeah, you're finding archeological sites uh, and then you're looking for them in the spaces that they've been found and then you're finding them and like all of the areas where other archaeological sites exist around that aren't sort of being looped in and because these predictive models aren't being revised on any sort of annual schedule um, you know I think that I think maybe even the one from the South Island is something that was developed over 20 years ago so um, yes absolutely those are out of date absolutely there are more ways to um, identify areas of potential. And I know that that is a challenge 
um, because a lot of archaeology firms don't allow for the time to do the research that's necessary. Um, they like they've traditionally relied on documentary sources or sources that are easily accessible. Um, this kind of work really involves working with the community and building those relationships over time. Um, and so if you're, did this person say that they're working for a First Nation? Um, I believe so. Let me just. Yeah. I mean, that could be ideal because then you and the community can develop these areas of potential yourself. Um, and if you're doing work in that community, then, then you have the benefit of that partnership, which is great. Yeah, it looks like they said they're working for a nation in northern BC and does permitting for the rest of the archaeology work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I hope that answers the question. I think so. Um, we have another question from Pat. Um, she asks, how do you collect wetland artifacts without disturbing it since they are so sensitive, like you were describing? Um, well, so I, the main way, like if you're talking just about recovering the objects from the site, using water pressure is extremely, extremely effective because um, the water will preferentially loosen sediment um, without having to use tools that are going to like scrape and crush and things like that. Um, yeah, so hydraulic excavation is the thing. And I, and a lot of people are like, oh, do you use like a fancy hose nozzle or something? But I find that actually just like the end of a hose and using your thumb to sort of control the water. Um, Archaeology is really low tech, you know, sometimes, but it's really effective. Um, if you think about how a stream eats away at the different sediments in a preferential way, it's the same thing. Um, so the, for example, I was working um, on a project for Comox First Nation, assisting them recovering a big fish trap panel. Um, and it was like almost six meters long. It's very significant. Um, the way that the beach um, sand sits with the object, if you, if you let a hose run, um, if you just put the hose there and let it run, it would eventually get all of the sediment away from the object. And then you could just pick up the object. Unfortunately, we were fighting the tides, so we had to use a little bit, we did encourage it along a bit, but um, that would be the number one thing. The, the second thing is if you have to use tools to get an object, it's really important to use um, either wooden spatulas and things like that, try to avoid using metal tools or even hard plastic tools. Um, and the third thing is that you just have to think about supporting objects and making sure that um, you're not undercutting them too much without putting a support underneath it. Um, yeah. If you have more questions about that, you're welcome to call me and I can give you some more specific examples for sure. Would you be comfortable with us uh, sharing your contact information in a wrap out email we're going to be sending to the participants? Yeah, for sure. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so I don't see any more Q&As in the chat, but I actually have two questions myself. Um, so now that we know that there's such knowledge gaps in terms of archaeological wet sites and, you know, this negative feedback loop, how prevalent is it that we're realizing these knowledge gaps and filling them from the education level? Like how much is that being integrated into new studies when new archaeologists or, or anthropologists are going to school, how much of that is being integrated into their education? Not, not at not all. So. <laughs> um, and that, that I think is based on sort of like the, the fact that, a, you know, like a lot of the profs, I mean, I should say I had to go to the UK to study wetland archaeology. So that tells you that there's not a lot of uh, awareness about that here. Um, a lot of the profs that teach at BC institutions know about this. Some of them, like even um, uh, like Farid Remtula, who works uh, at the University in Prince George there, has been working on a wet site. So like potentially his students know about that. Um, but a lot of uh, other archaeologists, while they know about it um, and they know the significance of it, they have their own projects that they're working on and they get their grad students to work on that. And again, there's like that negative feedback loop. Um, so until I cut ties with the museum and go off to academia and start teaching students, um, I think that it's pretty slow. Um, there are some grad students who have been focusing on um, what uh, wet archaeology and waterlogged sites. But again, I don't think that they're teaching yet, to my knowledge. So 
if anybody knows of someone who's teaching, please hook me up and we can, we can talk more. I think it's just, uh, I think the burden really falls on um, indigenous communities to be educating their archaeologists and the archaeologists that they work with um, and indigenous communities to be telling or sharing whichever stories that they are comfortable sharing with community members to highlight how important these sites are. Um, but again, I don't think that we need to uh, wait for the indigenous communities to be the ones to lead this. Um, we can start to just critically reflect on our own biases and start to broaden our awareness and hopefully bit by bit we can we can start doing more justice to these sites. Yeah. Um, so that's actually a good segue to my next question because in terms of you know the the rules and tools of archaeology, how much is traditional knowledge being integrated into when you are excavating these sites, whether it's a terrestrial site or a wet site, how much are is traditional knowledge and speaking to, you know, band members or nation members or elders um, helping guide your exclamation, your explanation of your findings. So like the use of that tool or the placement of that, that housing unit or the placing of that weir, like how much is that being integrated in like the general way that archeology span is being kind of assessed? Um, not as much as it could be. Um, so historically archeologists would excavate a site they may or may not talk to indigenous communities. They'd write the report. The report goes to the ARC ranch on file and that's it. Um, a few of the academic projects had involved indigenous community members a little more thoroughly. Um, nowadays, there's much more a working partnership between archeologists and um, indigenous communities. But I would say that like, you know, for example, when you're a consultant, a lot, all of the consultants um, will hire indigenous um, assistants to work on these sites. Um, how much consultation they do beforehand, I don't know. It totally varies depending on the company. Um, it's interesting to note that the archaeology branch refuses to um, refuses to include in the per in the wording of the permit that the archaeologist will hire an indigenous community member. Um, and I think that, that that comes from a place where they're saying, oh, that they can't enforce a client to pay for an Indigenous community member, but I don't understand why not. I mean, you have to pay an archaeologist anyway, so why wouldn't you just pay a community member whose material this is? Yeah. Um, and then I would say that um, specifically with regard to interpretation, um, it used to be that the archaeologists would excavate. They might talk to an indigenous community member while they're excavating. They might talk to an indigenous community member afterwards. Um, but again, that depends entirely on sort of the personality of the company. And then they would often write the report in isolation. Nowadays, there are more meaningful partnerships. So hopefully the indigenous community is involved at, at more of the steps. And certainly there is the, the custom, I don't know if it's technically a requirement. Yeah, I think maybe it is a requirement that the report gets sent to the indigenous communities. So um, there's definitely sort of an accountability to indigenous communities. So the time when archeologists could just say whatever they want is, is, is gone. Um, they now, all of their stuff gets run by the indigenous communities um, whether or not the Indigenous communities have time to review those and give feedback, I don't know, because a lot of communities have other priorities and, and some of them are understaffed. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last thing I would say is that for every permit application, um, the relevant First Nations or the interested First Nations are given a 30-day comment period. Um, for every permit that goes out. So Indigenous people are, are included at the beginning, but that doesn't necessarily feed into the interpretation. And they're included at the end when they get the report to review, but they may or may not choose to review it. So I think the critical part is to incorporate Indigenous people into the analysis portion. They're included in fieldwork, but they're not necessarily included in analysis. And I think it's important to include them in analysis and report writing to really get a meaningful balanced partnership. Awesome. Thank you. That's 
that was an awesome explanation. I know we do have one more question. We just had another question pop up in the Q and A. Um, we are at 11.02. Do you have a few more moments to answer one more question? Yeah, yeah for sure. Perfect. Thank you. Um, this next question is coming in from Sally and she asks, uh, where do these excavated objects usually go if there's no local museum? Are these objects recorded in one central location? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so yes, objects are recorded in one central location by virtue of what we call the um, Provincial Heritage Register. Um, that is a, is a tr sort of a tracking system that the RBCM holds. Um, and so it, I mean, when I say a tracking system, it's currently a set of binders where people used to like manually write down that, um, you know, archaeologists so-and-so recovered 20 objects from site X. So you would go to the record and you'd look up that site and you'd see that project A recovered 10 artifacts and project B recovered 500 artifacts and project C recovered 12, you know. Um, so yeah, those are records that we have at the RBCM and we only have those because we're the biggest and oldest museum at over 130 years. Um, and we started recording these things a long time ago. Um, that record is particularly uh, helpful for repatriation of objects because um, not all material goes to the same repository. So if a community wants to repatriate objects and they want to know where things have gone from a certain site, that's probably the first way to look for them. Um, it used to be that most material in the province went to the RBCM, but there are 50 repositories of different sizes across British Columbia now. And then they range from big ones like the RBCM and like uh, MOA, LOA uh, at UBC, um, all the way down to small community museums um, and indigenous led uh, cultural centers. Um, and the focus from my perspective is to build capacity within communities so that the material can stay in those communities. So when I was answering that question before about repatriation, um, if any community is ready to receive material, we are certainly happy to return it and not in that old classic Western white man way of being like, you have to have a perfect museum with climate controls, you know, like you do with it what you want. It's your material. We're ready to give it back under whatever circumstances you want. Um, and I think that, that is definitely challenging for some, uh, some museums that don't have that mindset. Um, yeah, so I hope that answers the question. I think that, that ideally they stay in the community, if not in the community, then close to the community, if not close to the community. Uh, the RBCM is like the sort of catch-all. And if like, you know, if there's ever a time when people don't have a place for it to go, then it goes here. Um, and then we also have a lot of material from Southern Vancouver Island, for example. So yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining us today, Genevieve, from your home. I know that you're a busy person with the, an, as a new mom. So thank you so much for taking your time <laughs> to join us today. Um, before we let everybody go, I just want to uh, lead your attention to the chat icon. Molly had put a link in there. This is for the evaluation form for the Wetland Institute speaker series. Because this is the first time we've hosted a series of webinars in lieu of our Wetlands Institute, we're trying to figure out if this was valuable to people and um, your feedback is extremely gr grateful. Um, positive, negative, any kind of feedback is beneficial. We're thinking about hosting another Institute Speaker Series next year. Um, to tie into our regular Wetland Institute speaker series. So if you liked it, give us a thumbs up. If you didn't, give us a thumbs down. We'd love to hear from you. And um, I know that Genevieve, you can't see anybody, but we've gotten some comments in the chat as well uh, saying thank you and um, that there was a, a lot of great information shared. So once again, I'd just like to thank you for spending the time with us today. And I'd like to thank everybody who joined us for these, uh, these couple hours this morning on this well, dreary, dreary day. Um, again, please fill out the form. Molly's going to send up a wrap out email and uh, there'll be a link to the webinar recording um, that will be there for a limited amount of time if you wanted to download it. And also the evaluation form link will be in the wrap up email as well. And we'll also have Genevieve's contact information if you have further questions. Um, thank you everybody and have a great day and I hope you stay dry.
Have a great one, everybody. See you later. Thank you.